Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, it's me and Marco and me on a Monday. Oh, I'm so happy to be here with Marco. Marco joins us by remote from the Big Island, ProVision Solar. And we're gonna talk about a bunch of things having to do with energy in Hawaii. Hi, Marco. Well, in the immortal words of that one-time female band, the Bangles, it's just another marvelous Monday. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> I wish it were fun day, which it is, to be with you again, Jay. Thank you. <laughs> With the emphasis being on whoa, whoa. <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> well, we've got a bunch of things that's happening. This is an easy agenda here in terms of find, finding the news. So let's talk about Verge. You were here last week for Verge. You spoke at Verge. We need to hear about Verge. What happened at Verge? Well, uh, just to briefly correct the, uh, the record, Your Honor, I, I was not a speaker at Verge. I attended uh, various sessions. I lurked in the hallway. I schmoozed with uh, both high and low potentates. I sat in a, in a Toyota Mirage, which is one of the first fuel cell vehicles which will be introduced to our beautiful island chain very soon by our friends at Servco Pacific. So uh, my overall impression is that without sounding too much of a cynic or or an angry solar guy, is that uh, I, I see with these various conferences, Jay, that there is a substantial, sometimes chasmous, disconnect between what is discussed at these conferences and the real world uh, lives of, the, of those of us in the solar trenches. Uh, who toil away in the sun and in our offices year after year, you know, putting in uh, rooftop solar, putting in utility scale solar and everything in between in terms of medium size solar, that uh, there is a lot less emphasis on what we are experiencing, what the state is experiencing day to day, month to month, week to week, versus the uh, the tendency to speak in rather uh, grandiose and uh, hopeful terms about hitting various benchmarks in 2045, which I am, uh, am uh, prone to remind people is, you know, that's 27 years away. And of course, uh, you know, like Bill Clinton uh, in his 1992 campaign, don't stop thinking about tomorrow using the Fleetwood Mac song of the 1970s. Yes, it's important to think about tomorrow, but tomorrow, the tomorrows of 27 years from now mean a lot less to me than the tomorrows of the next 6, 12 to 24 months. So I feel that these conferences don't really focus enough on kind of real world day-to-day -day issues and challenges and more kind of tend towards the more uh, uh, what's happening uh, or what will happen, what should happen uh, years and years from now. Yeah, I agree. Remember, too, that uh, Verge is um, a DBED conference, and uh, that means this is, you know, organized around government. And government, um, you know, always has the agenda of telling you they're doing great things. And so if, if, if you find they're talking about things 27 years away, the implication, at least to me, is there's not a whole lot of great things happening right now uh, because they're not talking about that. And so what I've, you know, I, I have found over the years that um, you got to be careful about who you listen to. You got to be careful about mixing the immediate with the, with the uh, aspirational. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of aspirational that takes place at Verge. But can you, uh, can you, can you talk about what were some of the sessions that you liked? Some of the, if you will, some of the aspirational things that came out, some of the hopeful, wishful kinds of technologies and possibilities? You know, I'm not the best person to, to talk about that, Jay. I appreciate the invitation. Let me, let me kind of go in a little bit, uh, um, perhaps a different direction in terms of, of that conference. Uh, and I do want to make the point that while, you know, from my perspective, um, it may be that I will have um, be less than satisfied with the content oftentimes, 
what I do find it very important is to see and speak with and reconnect with the other energy stakeholders in the stake in the state. And you know, to some extent, I'll call it a C. It's kind of the C and B scene. It's one of a, a very small number of energy conferences where you'll see most of the usual suspects. You know, uh, myself included. And uh, part of the value, a big part of the value for me, is just to reconnect with other fellow warriors and warrioresses there in the trenches. And it's just kind of good to see uh, familiar faces. And, uh, you know, the Hawaiian Electric has uh, usually a sizable contingent. So I saw a number of my HECO HELCO friends, which is valuable. And it's interesting to see who ponies up money to have displays there in in the, the foyer, you know, right outside a number of the, the, the conference rooms. So, uh, that I find is valuable in and of itself to, to reconnect with people because, you know, email is fine, texting is fine, phone is fine. But there is something to be said for seeing someone face-to-face and and uh, spending some, some time talking with them. So I don't want to give that plug. Uh, well, I agree, me, absolutely. Of, I, you know, and I would say that it's, especially here in Hawaii, in a, it's, a, you know, it's a culture point. And um, if you know somebody and have Guan Chi with someone, that's what you do at, at conferences like Verge. You develop Guan Chi, you see them, you say hi. <clears throat> that, that is a facilitator for making deals. If the individual is from far away and you don't know him, you don't have any, any personal relationship with him, it's just a little harder to make the deal. So as far as I'm concerned, that is the biggest single benefit of any of these conferences is the rubbing shoulders thing. Um, and it, it, it helps us, or at least it should help us, facilitate coming together as a community, making energy deals. That's how we build the industry. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, one of the early sessions on Tuesday morning was, I think, to, to me, it was the most kind of impactful. It was heavily attended by a, a number of the major players. Uh, Scott Sue, who is the one of the senior VPs for HECO, who I've known on and off for a good number of years. He's a really great guy. He was there uh, as part of a panel discussion along with Dean Nishina, who I also feel very, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect and, uh, and confidence in. He's uh, the consumer advocate uh, for the state. And there was a fellow there from uh, uh, the Boston Consulting London Economics, and they're the folks who got the close to $1 million uh, in state money uh, a year ago to look at utility ownership models, and we will be getting their report uh, prior to the 2019 opening of the 2019 legislature, which uh, I'll certainly be interested in seeing what they come up with. And part of that discussion had to do with uh, the really hot topic du jour, kind of the pretty shiny bobble, which uh, uh, comes uh, comes and goes over time, or various bobbles come and go over time, which is uh, this thing called performance-based rate making or performance-based regulation, which uh, our Public Utilities Commission is now taking up along with uh, 11 uh, wannabe interveners or participants, assuming the commission gives entree to all 11 uh, petitioners, and then the Hawaiian Electric Companies, the commission themselves, themselves, and also the consumer advocates. So a total of 14 parties uh, most likely will be sitting at round tables, so to speak, in the months to come, looking at this, this relatively newfangled thing called Pacific-based regulation, or excuse me, performance-based regulation. And well, let me, let me take concerns? a moment just to react to that. Sure. Say, <clears throat> Pacific, uh, performance-based uh, rate making is one thing. That's a limited part of regulation. But if you, if you say uh, performance-based regulation, you're talking about the whole enchilada. You're talking about everything. You're talking about a, oh, I don't know, a change of a change of mindset. It's a, a change of the way to look at it. It's a change, really, of everything having to do with regulating energy in Hawaii, um, and that's very significant. And then you talk about having a meeting uh, with some people and you know stakeholders and whatnot. It seems to me this is that's only phase one. That's just the very very you know very beginning. And that, and th- this is going to require an ongoing conversation, not just one group, one meeting, not just one time, one one period of time, one year, but 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 on and on and on, because um, we this is brand new material. 
a brand new way of thinking, a brand new culture, regulatory culture. And so this is, it's got huge implications, but continuing implications is my point. Well, I couldn't agree more, and you're absolutely right. In fact, the uh, decision by the commission, gosh, it goes back to, to April, I believe it was, to open this docket on PBR. Uh, I mean, it's really a fascinating document to read. I've read it over a couple times trying to get some nuance there. And interestingly, one of the presenters from, from the consulting group who were one of the sponsors of, of the conference you know, did a number of slides in this particular session, the early session on Tuesday morning, which was very well attended. Uh, and the implication of the slide was, well, a whole bunch of other utilities have already embarked down the path of PBR, including utility in the UK, utilities in different parts of the US. And I, I saw that, that particular slide, and when there was a Q&A afterwards, I piped up and I said, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my, it's my understanding that very few, if any, utilities, at least in the United States, had completely embark down the PBR path, let alone having operationalized it to any, any significant degree. So I took issue with this characterization that, well, this utility has done it and that utility has done it, and you see all these little, these little uh, pins, so to speak, on a map of the, of the continental U.S., the mainland U.S., and, and someone who didn't know better would have the impression that, gee, you know, here in Hawaii we're just kind of following suit with what others have done on the mainland already, and uh, uh, I, I took pretty strong exception to that, and the fellow from London Economics, the president there, I forget his name, he was one of the participants, he kind of pushed back at me, but he didn't really give, give to me a very strong explanation. In other words, as I've said uh, a number of times, and I, I really believe this, I just, I'm not saying it just for the hell of it, is that we are sailing into uncharted waters with this PBR. And it was good to hear that both Scott Sue and, and especially Dean Nishina, and it was fact Dean Nishina who, Nishina who spoke not just of the so-called unintended consequences of going down this path, but the pernicious, using the P word, the pernicious possible consequences of going down this path. And Scott Sue noted, you know, in open public forum, that Hawaiian Electric, HEI, is already at BBB minus for one or more of the credit agencies, either Fitch, Standard & Poor, or Moody's. So when you start dealing with moving from a uh, cost of service, or COS, which is the current regime and has been for decades, to PBR, you are going into areas that the investor class and the Wall Street folks are only now kind of getting up to speed on, and the per possible pernicious consequences are what's it going to do going this direction for, uh, to, to rate payers? What's it going to do in terms of uh, shareholders who own stock? Of, of not, you know, not a small number of people in the state own stock in HEI. So now this is not an argument why we should say, well, let's not do it. No, I'm not making that argument by, by any means. But I thought it was really telling that both Scott and Dean in that public forum said, you know, this, this is stuff that we've got to be very careful about as we proceed. And my impression, Jay, is that this commission, with Randy as chair, Randy Wasse as chair, with uh, Jay Griffin and soon to be with Jenny Potter, who I had a chance to spend some, some really great time with talking to her while I was there, and we've had her on the show now a couple times. I, I think that we couldn't ask for a better lineup with Randy, Jay, and Jenny as they look over this stuff, which is really, really cutting edge and super important to get it right. I totally agree, Marco, totally. And, um, you know, I, th I think we have to be mindful of how the of how Hawaiian Electric does in the uh, in Wall Street and the markets, um, and I think we have to be kind in dealing. You know, there's a there's a history. It, go, it goes back to before Next Era, <clears throat> of beating up on the utility, and we had a, a culture of so many quote stakeholders beating up on the utility in every way they could, <clears throat> and I think Wall Street noticed that, of course, and Wall Street noticed, of course, how we dealt with Next Era, which was not kind, uh, and I think uh, if we if we want to avoid Wall Street sort of um, putting all of that together in one bowl of porridge and saying Hawaii is unkind uh, to utilities. This is going to be an opportunity to be unkind to utilities 
therefore, ho, 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 better watch out. Um, but yeah. I, th I think, uh, you know, I think we have to show, we meaning everyone, we have to show Wall Street that, no, we can be kind. We understand. We understand that this is an opportunity to do great work um, for everyone, all sides of the fence, uh, for, the, for the stakeholders to come together, with the utility to come together, with the commission and find a new way. And, you know, up till now, I've really begun to question, or I had become, begun to question, whether we were the leader we thought we were. Everybody says, oh, you know, Hawaii is the leader in renewable energy, and I became, I began, I began to question that. But now, I think with performance-based regulation, I think we can become a leader in a more profound way, not only in, in, in building renewables, but in building a new model that'll work for everybody. If we do it right, not only will Wall Street, you know, respect us and, and respect the, uh, you know, the credit rating of the utility, as it should, um, but also Wall Street and the public and energy in general around the world will say, wow, that Hawaii, Hawaii is really innovative and, and understanding of the future, you know, and, and sort of, um, you know, future looking. <clears throat> this is a big opportunity for us on multiple levels. And we cannot, we cannot forget that. We cannot be mean to each other. We have to be kind. We have to be visionary. Don't you agree? Uh, completely. And the way it's been laid out in the order by the commission a couple of months ago is that phase one will take about nine months. And I imagine things will really start to move uh, more quickly uh, once Jenny becomes uh, the next commissioner, and that happens officially on Monday, July 2nd. I mean, her term would have started on July 1st, but July 1st is a Sunday, so she will be sworn in officially Monday, uh, which, my goodness, is two weeks from today. She will be the, the next commissioner taking the place of our friend uh, Lorena Kiba. Mm -hmm. So I think things will, um, you know, ramp up uh, at that point on, of course, that docket and others. And, and it'll really be something to behold, I think, Jay, over the next months to see how these 11 interveners slash participants and how the commission and how the utility company and how the CA, all 14 of them, play together as far as you know, there will be IRs flying, information requests flying in multiple directions on all kinds of topics. And essentially, the commission and the, and the staff will be the ringmasters uh, trying to keep it on track and uh, and not, uh, not go off in too many fanciful, wild, and crazy uh, directions. And it'll be very interesting to see after nine or so months after the end of phase one, how that's synthesized down to some type of, uh, of plan st and strategy in terms of moving forward. So this is going to take, you know, somewhere easily in the two to three plus year range when it comes to moving from cost of services based, which again, the utilities have been, IOUs, investor owned utilities have been operating under for decades, to something very dramatically different. In my opinion, I think everybody from Dean Nishina to the commissioners to the staff to the people at HECO, Helco Miko, to folks like you and I, I think uh, hopefully most of us get it in terms of just how important this is and how this is an opportunity, like you said, for Hawaii to be a leader which, you know, and, and oftentimes we're, we're followers, and that's okay, you know. But this, this is an example, I think, to, to show hopefully the rest of the country, if we get it right, which I believe we can, that we can do marvelous things here with, uh, with what we're blessed with in terms of renewable energy and with a, uh, a new regulatory uh, regime, which uh, hopefully will, uh, will move us in, 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 a, in a more better direction. Yeah, Marco, absolutely true. Uh, we, and you and I, uh, on this show, we have to follow it on a regular basis. We have to, we have to look at everything that happens and, um, and inform the public, but also um, you know, make, make our own commentaries and statements about how it's going. So let's take a short break. I only want to add one thing before we take the break, Marco, is that, is that there was a significant problem at, at Verge, and that is that you were not a speaker. You should have been a speaker. <laughs> Silly guys, they didn't make you a speaker. Okay, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dave Stevens, the uh, host of Cyber Underground, uh, every Friday here at 1 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. And then every episode is uploaded to the Cyber Underground, that library of shows that you can see of mine on youtube.com. 
And uh, I hope you'll join us here every Friday. We have some topical discussions about why security matters and what could scare the absolute bejesus out of you if you just try to watch my show all the way through. Hope to see you next time on Cyber Underground. Stay safe. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark. And every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me one o'clock on a Monday afternoon to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Okay, we're back. We're live with Marco uh, Mangelsdorf, um, joining us by uh, VoIP from uh, ProVision Solar and Hilo. And Hilo is only a few miles, what, maybe 20 miles, 30 miles away from the eruption. Are you affected? I think to some extent everybody on the island is to varying degrees. Jay, I mean, I felt a heightened sense of anxiety since, uh, you know, May 3rd is when the first fissure popped up. And, of course, uh, little did we know the extent to which uh, fissures 1, 2, 3, 10, and now up to, I think, 24 uh, would do what they've done in terms of destroying Kapoho. And uh, the uh, Green Lake, which was the largest, I learned, the largest freshwater lake in the entire state, it had been around for about 400 years with a depth of up to 200 feet, and that, that lake was evaporated in less than a handful of hours, Jay. I don't know if you ever heard that story, but the lava inundated the crater, caused the water to evaporate in three to four hours, which is just, uh, you know, words, words cannot hot. express. But, I mean, from my house, I'm going to live a little bit Malka above Hilo, close to the hospital. I can see the fountain 20 miles in the distance at night, and not only the fountain as it's illuminating the clouds in the distance, but you can see the clouds being illuminated to the left of the fountain from the lava flow, which is flowing from fissure number eight, which is the big one, uh, the one that's been most active all the way as the lava flows, uh, you know, in, in molten form down to the ocean. So it's really, it's unmistakable. It's, you know, four, three or four weeks ago, I could barely make out a glow. Well, the barely part, forget it. I mean, it's, it's very, very visible. And, you know, as far as how it's going to affect energy, on this island, it already has. I mean, Puna Geothermal Venture, which has been op had been operating for 25 years since '93, is offline. Whether it's going to be permanent or just temporary, of course, remains to be seen. But uh, when it's offline, that means that the the utility here, Helco, is more dependent upon imported fuel, uh, which means that uh, uh, the renewable percentage, uh, which hit 57 percent last year in terms of all the power that was consumed across the Helco grid was 57 percent, principally for geothermal wind and, and solar and hydro, that that number uh, is more or less halved to somewhere in the 28, 29 percent range with P PGV going down. And the, as we consume more petroleum products uh, to make up for that shortfall from PGV, that uh, essentially means uh, higher bills. Because so has uh, Helco actually brought fossil fuel generating stations back online? Well, I was told uh, by one of my Helco friends that what they have done is uh, effectively ramped up uh, production, ramped up output in the two biggest plants. The largest plant on the island is at Kehole, very close to the airport. That's about 80 megawatts. Keep in mind our peak consumption here during this time of year is around 150. Uh, so that has a peak output of 80. And then the second largest plant in terms of output is Hamakua Energy, which also used to be called Hamakua Energy Partners when it was our, owned by Arc Light Capital. But uh, that new ETI subsidiary called Pacific, was it Pacific Currents or Pacific Energy? I think it's Pacific Currents. Uh, they formed a new subsidiary, unregulated, uh, to purchase uh, HEP from ArcLight, and uh, that is now owned by Hawaiian Electric Industries through a subsidiary. So that's 60 megawatts. So what I've been told is that they ramped up the output for both HEP or Hamaku Energy and for Keahole. 
So we're not having uh, blackouts or brownouts or uh, no, no, shortages no. or anything like that? No, no, they've made clear repeatedly in the press, at least, uh, and I have no reason not to believe them, that uh, there's plenty of margin. Uh, once we get into the to the winter months, uh, typically December, January is when we have higher peaks, uh, uh, you know, as high as 180 plus megawatt range. So uh, I, I don't know what they will do then, but there's been no talk of rolling blackouts. But I guess on the positive side is that according to a piece in the um, – uh, Hilo uh, Hawaii Tribune Herald over the weekend is that uh, the, both the Public Utilities Commission and also Hawaiian Electric and Helco are uh, focused on, gee, what, what can we do in the short term and the near term to ramp up re renewables, uh, renewable deployment here on this island with the loss of PGV? So that's, you know, it, it's, it's an unfolding story well, so as it, to what they're going to do. It, that, that's, the, uh, that's the question, and, and, and I'm afraid to say that the other question, <clears throat> that is whether uh, PGV will ever come back, uh, the answer seems to me, anyway, obvious that it won't come back. It's done. <clears throat> I mean, uh, first of all, there's the, the business aspect of it. It was never all that profitable, and it always had a glass ceiling of 38 uh, megawatts. And it was never really going to get by that because of political, cultural resistance and considerations. Um, and so it was, it was never really making a lot of money. But the cost of, of putting it back, of putting Humpty back together again at this point seems to me to be really high. And, you know, it's not going to pencil out. Um, better, better to find other sources, other renewable sources on the Big Island. Uh, those, are, those are obvious and they're... Uh, uh, they're they're everywhere, really. The other the other thing is um, um, that that uh, um, the, the, this cultural resistance to putting it back online. Aside from the cultural resistance we had from way back in the 90s and Millie Lani Trask and all that, um, there would be huge cultural resistance to putting putting it back online now um, because they'd be afraid. You know, I mean, some people blame the eruption on the violation of, of Pele. Uh, right. The eruption would not have happened except that we somehow aggravated Pele. Um, and so I think that would surface again, literally, and, and people, people are not going to support this. I think it's over, don't you? Uh, I think my first response has to be it, it's too early to tell uh, until the eruption subsides and we're now, I just counted recently, or uh, just counted earlier today, that uh, if it started on, on the 3rd of May, so there are 31 days in May, right? So that uh, 28 days in May it was erupting, plus we're now uh, day 18, so 31 now, 28 plus 18, by my math, that comes out to 46. So we're in day 46 of the eruption. And uh, prior, you know, in, in decades gone by, it erupted from, uh, you know, 28-plus days to I think the last one was 88 days. So, you know, does that serve as any guide as to how long this one's going to go? You know, not really. I mean, it could go on. It could stop tomorrow. It could go on for weeks or months, right? So until the eruption subsides, uh, we don't have really complete information until we kind of take stock. But uh, I've, I've, you know, publicly stated that I'm not anti-geothermal, but I am pro-reality check. And <laughs> as, a, as a political observer, Jay, I cannot make a credible analysis and argument as to there being when it does stop, assuming that the place isn't er erased from the earth with uh, with lava and ind inundation across the entire facility. Right now, it's it's bracketed on three sides by lava, and there's one l land path to get to it from the east, east northeast, but there are no roads uh, to be able to to get to it. So, I mean, if it gets erased from the planet as Kapoho did, I think 100 percent, 1,000 percent, you're absolutely right. Geothermal, at least in Pune, is, is dead for our lifetimes. If it somehow remains intact after the eruption subsides, I still cannot make the case as a more or less neutral political analyst that there would be adequate popular support and public uh, pop, pop, popular support and political will to bring it back. I know my friend Senator Russell Ruderman, who represents that area, he was against geothermal back then in the 80s and 90s. He's against it now. Uh, I, I just can't see that there would be a path to bringing it back online.
I can't make that, but other people, you know, in good conscience and good, uh, you know, with good motivation, they can disagree with that. But that I just can't make that. I can't make that leap in my mind that there would be the popular support or political will to bring it back. Yeah, let me add that I just got back from Iceland, Marco, and in Iceland they have volcanoes and uh, their eruptions are. Uh, you know, one thing it all teaches us: eruptions don't last forever. There's always an end date for an eruption. It may last for you know weeks or months, but it's always going to end. And this one will end, just as the ones in Iceland always end. But then you can have another one later. And and the and the risk is you know that uh, you, you thought you were you thought you were home free after the first one. Well, turn around, you have another one. And that's what happened a few years ago. They had one in I think 2010, and a year later they had another one in 2011 or 12. And uh, the second one was much worse than the first one. And the the, um, the um, material went up in um, up into the the air of 12 miles high, uh, and it, it uh, obstructed uh, flight operations all over Europe. I remember that's, that. That's how thick it was both times, and and so um, that's that's what comes with volcanoes. On the other hand, people in Iceland uh, they like geothermal. They like being in a seismic area this way. Um, they, they make all their hot water out of geothermal. You see in the middle of Reykjavik, you see geothermal facilities uh, heating the water. Uh, in big housing projects, in big office projects, the water is heated by geothermal. You see it right there, and it's apparently not far below the surface. Um, and in fact, uh, most of the energy, aside from vehicular you know, fossil fuel, and there's some of that, um, most of the energy in Iceland is from uh, geothermal. So I think uh, they're very comfortable with it. It's part of their landscape. It's part of their environment. Uh, they don't have any cultural bias against it, and they're going to want to continue it no matter what happens, and it's, it's part of the way they get energy. We don't have the same cultural view of it, and I'm afraid we have uh, other alternatives that are much more appealing to the, the, um, to, to the public. Anyway, we're out of time, uh, so I want to thank you again, Marco, for this great discussion. And I'll tell you how much I look forward to uh, another such follow-up two weeks from hence. Uh, so much is happening in energy, and it's so great to talk to you about it. Well, welcome back, Jay, and thank you, as always, for having me. It's like uh, reconnecting with an old and dear friend every time we talk. Thank you. Thank you, Marco.